Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, uh, the Prince of Peace. <laughs> She brought forth her firstborn son, 
miraculous swan and clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <laughs> shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord 
came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So, things have been a bit different in our house uh, on Friday mornings. Um, what happened was, um, I started a series of little teaching segments on history. I'm interested in history, always been interested in it. And there was a, we were part of a Fun Educators Network, and there were lots of parents saying, oh well, you know, they, they like to kind of go and just, just Anybody who's facilitating a kind of teaching session, they're interested in that. And, and Kirsty said to me, well, you know, there's, there's not a lot of history going on. Not a lot, not learning much about history. You're really interested in history. And um, maybe you'd like to do like a little lesson, you know, just from the, the kids or the mums that we know. So I said, yeah, I'd do that. And uh, we've ended up with about, I think it's 22 children now <laughs> that, go, that come to these sessions. And we split it in half. You know, but the parents keep sending them, the fools, keep sending them to me to be taught history. And it's great because it's like ignited their interest. They want to know about all these strange and wonderful things that have gone on before. Uh, and for most of the time, they're a really great bunch, you know. And, and they're just like, yeah, I want to know more, I want to know more about this. And why did they do these things? But just very occasionally, and, and if you've ever worked with children, you'll know this, or if you're a parent, it's very occasionally, and obviously none of my children, right, but very occasionally, a little bit of silliness comes in. You know, just a little bit of silliness. So you tell them a fact about, like, you're teaching about the Celts, right? And I was like, the Celts, they built these round houses, and they made the walls out of, out of twigs and, and mud and, and animal poo. Well, that was it. They, I couldn't get them back. It was just like, hilarity. You know, it's, it's, it's so silly. Why did they do that? And and then that silliness can kind of descend into a kind of levity. You know, levity where it's like you know they start to laugh at inappropriate things. Where it's like you know not everything is a comedy gold moment, is it? And there's sometimes where look, this is like serious. It's like really, this is really meaningful. And it's not just like. And you want to kind of like take the child and say, look. Listen, if you understood the socio-political, cultural background of all this, you wouldn't be laughing. Because what it shows is actually, it, it, what it says is something about you and the fact that your life is so detached and so insular and so small. It doesn't say something about you, not the subject. You can't do that with children. But I think sometimes when we come to the familiarity of the nativity and all this stuff. So it's so easy to lampoon it, isn't it? And absolutely, we're going to deal with some fairly deep things this morning, you know, some really eternally important things. And whilst it's easy to kind of sneer, um, maybe that says more about you uh, than the actual subject. And so I want to ask you to come with an open mind, really, uh, this morning. And we're going to be talking about things that, that really come from outside of our own experience of life, certainly, you know, the, the mundanity of life. It's not every day, is it, that a virgin uh, is giving birth to a child, or that, you know, uh, angels appear in the sky with a message. That's not happening all the time. That's not really part of our lives, is it? But it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And so I just ask you this morning to try and come with a, just a, an open mind to understand uh, what, what is being said. I'm just going to go through just three main points this morning. Um, glory to God in the highest. That was the message, wasn't it, of the angels that they brought. Glory to God in the highest. And in fact, the Bible uses words like glory, honour, praise, worship in connection with God. Doesn't it? So this is what you should do. You should worship God. You should glorify God. Why? Why does God need all this worship? 
Glory. In fact, that's what I had a person say to me once, well, if I was God, if I was God, I wouldn't actually want anyone to worship me. You know, I wouldn't want people bowing down to me. If I was God, I, I think I'd be really uncomfortable with that. Um, I think that's good. I think, it, I think it's, you know, I think it'd be worrying if there was a human being who wanted people to worship them. I, I, I don't think, you know, what's the word that everybody uses today? I think it would be inappropriate, wouldn't it? To, if, if you had a human being who wanted everybody to worship them, you know, just, just, just a person, just your average person in the street, yeah, I'd like everybody to worship me, uh, that would worry me, I think. But why? Because human beings are fallible. Aren't we? We're limited in our knowledge. Uh, we're limited in our intelligence. So we've got to find that out here. But, but we're limited in our intelligence. We don't know everything, do we? Uh, we're limited also in the sense that uh, we're limited by our body, by, by, by the fact that you know, we can only be in one place at a time. And in our body we suffer from infirmities, from weakness, from sickness, uh, sickness of the body, sickness of the mind, sickness of the emotions. You know, we, we really are fallible creatures. Uh, and therefore, it, it would be perhaps, you know, it's hardly a being meriting glory in the highest, is it? Um, you know, and, and, and the thing is, once you start growing older, and you think you're actually starting to learn at last some wisdom, by some seemingly cruel twist of fate, uh, your memory starts to fail you and you can't remember what it is you've learned. So, so not really the sort of being you would want to worship, a human being. God, however, represents all that is above us, both spiritually and morally. In the book of Isaiah, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. The God is omniscient. The God of the Bible is all-knowing. Uh, and, and in order to be so, a particular type of being or, or, or God has to be defined. You can't like go to uh, the flawed heroes of myth and legend. Uh, many of them are not omniscient. You know, many of them are, are forever fighting with one another. Uh, many of them are, are, are limited to what. So, so you've got to first of all define your term. When you say God, glory to God in the highest, what do we mean? We mean the God who stands outside of time. He, he is timeless, spaceless. Uh, a God who knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46. Those tenses. He knows the end from the beginning. He's not like he's not limited in his knowledge in the way we are. Because we make decisions, don't we, based on what we know. And then you find out, oh, I didn't know that. If I knew that, I would have made that decision. God is not like that. God stands outside of that and above that. A God who is not limited by the flesh as we are. He is that the theological term is incorporeal. Okay, so he's not limited by a body, he doesn't grow old or weak. He doesn't have infirmities that he has to wrestle with that maybe cloud his judgment. God is a spirit, John 4, 24 says. So we're talking about here a being who is omniscient, who, who is not limited by a body, uh, who stands outside of space and time, who is a spirit, a God who is transcendent. But he's not only transcendent, he is imminent. In other words, he is not only far above, but he is close at hand. And that for me makes all the difference. You know? And I read the scriptures, that makes such because yeah, I want to know that God is above everything. I want to know that God is all knowing, all powerful, and is going to judge the world. Uh, I want to know that, but I also want to know that actually he cares about me and you. That, that actually he is able to step into time, into reality and actually deal with humanity. And that is what we're looking at here, isn't it? In this primitive, in this kind of simplistic, uh, childlike way, the birth of Jesus Christ is just that. It is God coming from outside of time into time, into a moment in time, in Bethlehem, in Judea, and taking onto himself human flesh 
I'm being born in, in humility and state. Not, not, you know, with trumpets blaring and like, here he is on the mountain top. You know, he's born in these humble uh, circumstances. But he is, he is far above, but he's also close at hand. In Acts 17, the Apostle Paul preached, Seek the Lord and feel after him and fight him, though he be not far from every one of us. It's close at hand. God is not far from each one of us. What makes him far from each one of us sometimes is our unwillingness to heed God's words. Or perhaps even a misconception of who God is. A misconception of what kind of God is being, is being represented. Seek the Lord and feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Not far. God is not far from each one of us. What's the next thing that the angels said? They promised peace on earth. Peace on earth. That happened, does it? Is the, you know, the wars stopped, have they? I, I missed something, missed something on the news. Uh, you know, we, we announced this morning no more warfare. There's no there's nobody there's nobody arguing around the table, there's no gang fights going on. Is that is that happening? Sadly no. It's not happening, is it? There is not peace in the sense, there's not a cessation of military conflict. Um, and no wonder, because Christ himself says, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. It's also as if he knew the end from the beginning, isn't it? Again, Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. I thought Jesus was the, was the peace child. I thought he was coming to bring world peace. Maybe it was the, you know, the writer of the gospel. Maybe Matthew hadn't read Isaiah. Do you think that's what it is? They didn't know. They didn't know this. Or it could be, couldn't it? that maybe the Bible is talking about more than one kind of peace. And I believe that's exactly what it's talking about. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. And just the first verse that it says... Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the peace he's talking about. Peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. A peace that passes all understanding. Says, this is the peace. This is this is the peace that is promised. An end, not an end to military conflict in the world. As, as long as men have sin in their hearts, such things will continue. As long as men are greedy and covetous and desiring power, such things will, will continue. Well, this is a peace that is promised. An end to a conflict between you and God. An end to one preacher called it a controversy. An end to that controversy between you and God. Peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace on earth. In fact, we sang it, didn't we? We sang it in the very first Christmas carol that we sung in our service. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. That's what it's about. That's the peace he's talking about. That God wants to reconcile you to himself. He wants to bring peace. He wants to be a cessation of conflict between you and him. But since he is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, knows the end from the beginning, is the creator of time and space and the universe, it's unlikely that he's going to capitulate to you, is it? It's unlikely 
that such a being is going to bow to your superior intelligence and knowledge and, and, and strength. Therefore, there's only one way it's going to happen, and that is if you yield to God himself. If you come and, and receive that peace that was promised through Jesus Christ, that reconciliation, and it starts... God and sinners reconciled. It starts with an understanding that I'm a sinner. There's sin in my life and I need forgiveness for that sin. That's where it has to start. We have to see ourselves, you know, uh, as we truly are. The, the, the Bible says of itself that it's like a mirror. That when you read it, you can see yourself reflected in the words. And sometimes, I don't know, if you, I get up early in the morning, look at myself in the mirror and, and some. Don't, look, don't go, oh, looking gorgeous. <laughs> look in the mirror and think, what? There's some work needs doing here. And sometimes it's like that with the Bible. You read the Bible and it's like you're reflected in the pages and you think, oh, this person's awful. Well, hang on a minute, this is me. This is me. And God is saying, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to reconcile you to myself. If you will surrender who you are, if you will not uh, sneer and mock, these great truths that I'm sharing with you, these things that I'm telling you, then you then you have hope. What's that Christmas carol? Uh, I think it's Little Town of Bethlehem. We're not right down here this morning, but there's a line in it that says, Where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. I love that line. I love that line because meekness, it's humility, isn't it? It's like if you humble yourself before God. He'll enter into your heart. Anyone. You don't have to be you know, rich or religious, whatever that means. You just have to, you know, humble yourself before God and listen to what he's saying. Say, okay, maybe I don't know everything. It's this reconciliation of you to God that's the great, greatest example of divine goodwill. That's what it said, wasn't it? Goodwill toward men. That there is no greater example of God's goodwill to us as human beings than saying Jesus Christ, you know, as a as a baby, helpless in that manger. He's saying, you know, this this is this is your redeemer. This is the this is what's going to bring you back to me. This is what's going to give you that peace of mind that you are so desperately looking for. That you are beside yourself saying, How can I have peace of mind? Well, you have to have peace with God. You have to have peace with your creator. See, what happens is there's a desire within all of us to worship God. Everybody has that desire. They know that they should bow down and worship God. But because they reject God, because they harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit, they fill it with other things. Right? So, like, you know, you get people in the, like, you know, in someone's house, there used to be a house near us. We lived in Cheadle Heath, right? And there's this house near us. And on the front of the house, the house was called Graceland. Right, and I had a picture of Elvis on the front of the house, I'm kidding. Like a picture of Elvis, and, and, and you could see in the window, there was you know, the king, and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and their idol, the person they worshipped was Elvis Presley, right, the singer. The king of rock and roll. And, and to them, yeah, he's, the, he's my idol. And so, so it's this, it becomes this dysfunctional desire to worship other people as football teams, you know, or celebrities. Or even, you know, political figures or something like that. They become the main thing in their life. This is the thing I'm building my life around. But it's a dysfunctional reaction to the loss of worship of God. It's really God. That place belongs to God. That place belongs to He who is above everything else. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. It belongs to the Creator, to the Judge of the Universe. It belongs to man. It's inappropriate to worship another man or a woman. In some people's relationships, they put their husband or their wife or their girlfriend or boyfriend on this pedestal. Oh, they're so perfect and inevitably become disappointed, let down. Because you don't worship human beings, you worship God. That's his rightful place. Why does God need it? Why does he need to be worshipped if he's so great, if he's so powerful, if he's so almighty? Why does he need all this worship? Well, I'll let you to secret. God doesn't need it. It's you and me who need it. We need to be in that place, in that proper place with our Creator. And acknowledge and give Him 
that place in our lives. And God will give us the greatest gift that can be given this Christmas. And that is eternal spiritual life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation, to be saved, to be saved from this world, to be saved from the darkness of sin and the delusion of this world, to have your eyes open and to see the glory of God, glory in the highest, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. And I want to thank God for the goodwill that He's shown to me and to my family and, and, and through others as well who we, blessed us this Christmas time. And thank you for, for those people who blessed me and my family this Christmas. You know, God is good and, and, and He blesses us if we trust in Him and give our hearts. To him. So I'd encourage you this Christmas time, do think about Jesus Christ, about this nativity. Do try and enjoy, you know, enjoy all the kids dressed up as shepherds and wise men. Enjoy that. It's, it's brilliant, isn't it? I love it. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But don't forget what Christmas is actually about. Don't forget what we're celebrating here this morning. And that is Jesus Christ saving the world. And that if you think about that, if you come to him and humble yourself, he can be your savior too. Let's pray. Have a Praise the Lord. The, the chorus goes like this. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Son of God. <laughs>